Welcome everybody to another episode of Amplify Your Business. Today, I am joined by Ashley McCarney. She is the founder and president over at Involvi. Welcome to the show today, Ashley. Thank you for having me, Lance. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, before we get into what you do over at Involvi, what you've created there, let's first understand from you and your experience being an entrepreneur, what you think every entrepreneur needs to know. I'm just going to limit you to three. Perfect. Um, you know, I think number one is your time is quantifiable. So mm -hmm. if you are spending eight hours doing your bookkeeping and a professional bookkeeper could take, do it in 30 minutes, you know, save your time and focus on what you're really good at and, and ask for help. Um, next of all, I would say, you know, get used to the unexpected, be flexible, be nimble, um, and always look to innovate because I think if we don't innovate, we will get lost definitely in the dust. Yep. Um, and then last but not least, figure out your why as an entrepreneur. I think, you know, we get passionate about making widgets, helping people, creating marketing campaigns, right? Um, but if we as entrepreneurs don't know our why and what drives us to do what we do, um, then it's very hard for employees or clients to follow us and buy what we have to sell. So those three things I would say. Oh, hey, well, hit us with your why then. What is it that uh, has motivated you to do what you do? You know, my career is steadfast in people operations and supporting people in different business um, businesses and industries. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the employment relationship gets lost between KPIs and revenues and, and all of mm -hmm. this growth that businesses want to have, which is a good thing. But we're still humans and we still have to go to work every day and come home to our families. And and realistically, if if we can make those employment relationships more seamless and we can help leaders be better people leaders, um, then you're not going to need the loopholes and the compliance and all of that, even though it's still there. Um, so at the end of the day, I just want to make work a better place. I just want to make relationships better and, and help people understand each other. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But and speaking of all of that. Give us the the pitch. What is Involvi? What problems are you trying to solve over at Involvi then? Yeah, so Involvi is an HR consulting firm and, and offering four major things. One is HR support. So we're a fractional and or um, um, the word has escaped me right now, but you know we're a fractional managed service for HR in three different levels and we customize that for clients, mostly in the small and medium business space and, and not for profits. Uh, okay. We also offer customized learning and development and training and two-day workshops. Uh, we offer recruitment, but it's in our own way. So we're not a headhunter as you know them, but uh, it definitely does support our clients with bringing new humans onto their team. Um, okay. And then we do one-off projects, compensation reviews, investigations, foundation packages. Um, it's a variety of things. But at the end of the day, we know each business is different and uh, we customize what we do to fit the needs of that business um, because like you, we're a cost function and, and unlike you, we don't see those returns as clearly in market or in HR as we do in marketing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we want to create that ROI and, and not be a make work project for those clients. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And so yeah. how are you approaching it different than say the rest of the HR companies in your space then? Because, you know, there's, there's a number of people out there selling yeah. HR services. So how do you really stand out in the crowd? You know, I think it's a couple approaches. One, it's that customization. We don't have a process or a box, if you will, and fit the clients in and then move them through those steps and, and they feel like they're confined. Um, I think the other thing is it, my own statistic that is not founded by research, but, you know, 99% of employers, including myself and, and likely you, work in some sort of gray area when it comes to legislation, compliance, human rights, things like that. And so it's that balance of risk and that balance of legislation in how you as the owner want to run your company and how you want to treat your staff and the perks or benefits that you want to provide them. Um, and so we will help clients work in the gray. Yeah. Um, very often we come in and do a gap analysis or whatever our first steps are. And then we say, OK, Lance, in your business, here is your red flag risks. And this is the risk you're up against if the piper, as I say, comes calling and you get yeah. sued or what have you. Um, and then it's up to you to say, no, Ash, I, I'm good with that level of risk and my risk tolerance. I want to keep where we are 
And if we get that phone call, we get that phone call. Um, other clients are, oh, no, I didn't know that. Let's move to the black and white. And so, you know, we come in with trusted understanding and really want to work with and partner with those businesses rather than come in and either do it for them or, you know, hold them to a standard that doesn't fit with their business because um, yeah. we're not building trust. And then it feels like we come in with an agenda and, and that we don't do. Yeah. 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 The trust building is, is massive in your industry in particular, I think, I mean, in general, in business, we have to have that, but I, I mean, for what you guys are doing, I think that's a really critical element, right? Yeah. When I usually talk to clients, I use the analogy, which sometimes people chuckle, but you know, trusting us with your people in your offices and in your business is almost like new parents trusting their infant with a new babysitter, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily as, emotional or, or personal. Um, but there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have and they have to trust that we're supporting them and the business and the culture and their team in speaking on behalf of them. Right. So yeah. that trust takes time and, and we're grateful, you know, to have that trust with our group of clients. Yeah. So Ashley, you just recently celebrated your four year anniversary for Involvi, And mm -hmm. I'm just curious, four years ago, what made you decide to jump into entrepreneurship and start this? Because uh, this is the first venture you've you've started, I believe. So, it so is. what was the motivator there? Uh, you know, I think it was a, a recipe of a few things. I entrepreneurship does run in my family, and it was always mm -hmm. appealing to me. But as the breadwinner for my family, it was always a big leap not to have that stability, not to have that paycheck, right? Yeah. Um, and so I was on maternity leave with my son. He was six months old at the time, and. I found myself without a job to go back to after Matt leave for various reasons. Uh, and it really caused me to step back and say, now that my life has changed and I've got a much you know, more important focus, where do I want to leave impact and what do I want to do when I'm not at home? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I chatted with my husband and, and said, I, I'm going to do this. And I just started consulting a little bit to make ends meet on Matt leave because it's generous, but not financially survivable. Yeah. Um, and then I just got a few referrals and started building, started building. And, and here we are today. And, and, you know, I found a passion for entrepreneurship. I found a passion for, you know, selling something I'm passionate about and helping our clients. And it, I'm grateful, but it kind of just grew, even though I didn't have a plan and didn't expect to be where we are today. Um, really grateful for the journey. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just thinking back here to, you know, four years ago, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. And so it's, it's, okay. So I don't have a job to return to. I have a six month ba old baby yeah. and you have another child that was young too, right? No, no, we've only got one. Oh, Dexter okay. was, okay. Yeah. So, so you have a six month old baby and, uh, you're, you're thinking, you know, I'm just going to build a business now. I yeah. like, it, it's so funny, right? Because there's a part of me that's like, okay, well that makes sense because you have the ability to, you have some of that mat leave uh, income coming in. And so that is going to support a little bit as that slow start, as you start to ramp up the business. But then it's like, my God, you have a six month old baby at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That yeah, must've been uh, some interesting conversations with your husband anyway. It was. And, you know, I'm grateful for him being supportive. And, and my mom was a huge part of of supporting me and Dexter yeah. and my son and, and our yeah, family. Yeah. And, you know, I think it couldn't have happened without all of that. And it was I always take on too much. I've always got 100 things on the go. And <laughs> and, you know, I don't think that I thought enough into the future of what does building your own business mean? I was, of course, naive and thought, well, I'm just going to be a consultant. I want a little bit of freedom. I want to help clients that I enjoy working with and 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 vice versa. Um, but I didn't have a dream to have employees and to have office space and to be as large as we've become. Yeah. Uh, and that grew organically. Uh, and as I said, I wouldn't change it for the world, but it definitely wasn't part of that thought process of let's start a business to grow it to this size with a son. It was just let's yeah. make ends meet and and do something I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And then the success, success came because of obviously your personality. It sounds like you can handle a lot. And so you mentioned that you've rapidly scaled the business over those four years. I'm curious, what do you attribute the success of that to? Is there anything that you can kind of point to be like this? This was really the reason why we were able to achieve what we have achieved so far. Yeah, I think it's a couple things. I think it's 
believing in the why and and being flexible to adapt our offerings to fit what the market was telling us, right? right? As you likely know, you start with an offering that makes sense and you tweak it and mold it. And and now, as I said at the beginning, we've got, you know, four or five really, really solid services that are supporting our clients in a good way. Um, and I just, I just think the other team piece is my team, um, you know, probably got rose colored glasses on, but I've worked with a lot of teams. I've seen a lot of teams operate that have failed, that have been successful. And the yep. team that I've got are just fabulous humans that are passionate also about what they do. Um, and they've helped me grow the business. They help me strategically plan. They help me create, you know, different offerings that they're passionate about. And once I got them involved in some of that, they're almost entrepreneurial minded in their own right. Uh, and so that just bred success. Uh, I think lastly, it's it's the network, right? I, I talk mm. to students in at Nate and, and at other schools. And, you know, it's that intentional networking that when you're in university, you say, hi, I'm Ashley. Nice to meet you, president of whatever company you think, oh, they're going to remember me. No, they meet hundreds of students all the time. They're not going to remember you. Um, but authentically getting to know your network and curating that network and 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 listening and and being open to learning. Um, I was really fortunate. We built our business on referrals and that couldn't have happened without the network or my team. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so critical to have that network and continue to grow the network. And that's one of the things, you know, as a, as a person who's in marketing, um, I have a lot of people surprised when, uh, you know, they come to me and they ask me, well, what can I do? And that's one of the first things that I'm asking them is, well, what kind of network do you have? Like, how much are you spending in terms of going out there and, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, pressing the flesh, you know, shaking hands and, and, uh, and really meeting people because you build relationships so much quicker. The trust comes so much quicker. The sales then follow, um, a lot more, uh, quickly, typically as well. So yeah. there's lots of tactics that you can use in marketing, but really, if you can get out there and do a one-on-one -on -one personal selling, that is really the best, uh, thing that you can do. Difficult to scale but it's definitely at the beginning for sure what you need to be focused on. Yeah. I think one of the other things which I experienced with your team too, as we engaged was, was that sell without selling, right? I am yeah. not going into any client meeting with an agenda, with a sales pitch or anything. Yes, it naturally comes because we're entrepreneurs and, and that's kind of what we do. But, you know, I probably give out too much free support. I probably, you know, yeah you know, have too many conversations without sending an invoice. And, and for me, yes, we have to be in the black and yes, we have to make some money, but it's not about padding and, and growing the pocketbook. For yep. me, it's about seeing that value, seeing those leaders have a better, you know, employment life because they don't have as many people issues or they get gain those skills to work with their people in a different way. Yep. Um, and so I think, and understand from our clients feedback that that's really a value to them. They don't feel like they're being nickel and dimed and, you know, the invoice is growing every month and they don't know why. Um, for us, it's more about meeting those needs and, and creating those solutions. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's the, the beautiful thing about solutions based selling. And when you have a company that's in the, you know, has a service that is a solution for uh, some very specific and, and uh, important needs that your client base has it's it's really quite easy right to talk about that why and really motivate people to to have that next conversation with you because it really is coming from a place of wanting to support and help and and uh you know enable them to do the things that they're going to need to do to grow their businesses as well right so it's really good i i'm curious um because you talked a little bit about the team and so um, that is really the reason, one of the core reasons why you've experienced so much growth is you've, you've built a really great team. Now, being an HR professional uh, yourself, I mean, obviously you have tackled that with a whole bunch of uh, domain expertise that the average entrepreneur does not have. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you had like one or two pieces of advice in terms of how an entrepreneur can do that and do that really well so that they could also experience that same rapid growth and success and empowering that team to really fuel the business that you have experienced, um, knowing what you know and how you applied it. Yeah, that's, that's a convoluted question. Um, yeah, it's probably difficult to, that, that, that's a, that's an eight hour masterclass. I'd imagine. It could right? be. Yeah, it could be. I'll work on that. Um, I'm just trying to think back, you know, 
I think number one, as I talked about your why, I think I yeah. derived the interview questions and or process when bringing on my team around that. Um, and it was really evident who would get on board and who aligned with that, even if they had a few different values or a few different approaches. I don't want mini me's. Um, but, you know, empowering them for their individual thought and bringing that in and, and welcoming that. Um, some of the team has been very um, receptive and, and provided feedback on the opportunities that they're given underneath the Involvey brand to learn new things, to teach the team, to collaborate. You know, we have little work groups where I give a vision or the leadership team gives a vision and says, who wants to explore this a little bit more? And, and then, you know, we work cross teams in these little work groups and champion those people to bring things forward. So I think outside of the day-to-day -day client support, which can be anything from transactional to strategic, they also get this entrepreneurial opportunity to build something within Involvey. Um, so I think that's one thing. Um, I've definitely leveraged some of our vendors um, for things like behavioral assessments or team building assessments. Um, so yep. that not only pre-hire, I know who's coming on and I know that I have the skill set and capacity to train them and, and onboard them in a way that will work for them. Um, but I think it's also just the transparency that we have across the team. And I there is, while there is a formal hierarchy, I don't believe there is, right? I'll call up an employee and talk to them. And sometimes one of my managers will say, yeah, but you're the boss and you're the boss's boss. And, you know, that doesn't even phase me sometimes and naively so it, it, because it is a reality. Um, but I really appreciate our flat hierarchy and the fact that we can just go have a glass of wine or we can just go yeah. have coffee and, and talk. Yeah. And it feels more like a community than it does a hierarchy of, of team. It is interesting what you talk about in terms of the hierarchy, right? Where, um, so I don't perceive there being much of a hierarchy within the business. Yeah. Uh, like in our business and yet i like uh some of our our newer employees uh we're at the size now where i just don't interact with them very often and so there's this um uh not fear but there's a um an element of like they're not sure if they can reach out to me and uh, mm -hmm. or should reach out to me or anything like that and i've always been like no my door is always open i definitely have an open door policy and so if you need anything at all i don't it doesn't matter who you are but it just never dawned on me that there would be people within the organization who are like yeah, i don't know that's the boss up there right like I, I i can't really bother him he's got too many other important things and it's so weird when it gets to that size when your business gets to that size where where that is part of their re kind of reality or perception it's definitely still not part of mine <laughs> i yeah. just don't don't feel that way that i'm like at the top of this this hierarchy of uh of people yeah it's weird well and it becomes even more challenging because while you want that full circle and that open door as you talked about you also don't want to undermine the managers you've promoted yeah. that those people report to, right? Yeah. Um, and so I find myself talking to my managers more because if their team comes to me for a discussion or I call them, I now call the manager and say, hey, just had a conversation with so-and-so. Here's the update so that you're in the loop and, and don't find out later on. Totally. Um, but yeah. I, I do have a story about that because I saw a great example of how to mitigate that in a larger organization okay. where the CEO has no power in the organization for financial decisions, termination decisions, employment decisions, anything. He's very transparently given it to the COO and the CFO. And yeah. so he has lunch with every employee on a constant rotation on a regular cadence, but it is truly just lunch and get to know you because the team knows and believes and trusts that he can't fire them. He can't give them a raise. He can't performance manage them or anything else. He's just getting to know them. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure there's things that don't work, but at a high level that creates that really good feedback loop, um, to the yep. highest level of the company. And when yep. that person is out selling and doing what you and I do, they're also now in touch with the front lines. Um, and it, yep. it's worked out pretty well in that organization. Well, I, I can imagine, I can see the benefits of that because I mean, the other thing that I think would, uh, be really great is that it will transfer from the CEO, his or her vision, and also passion and the why and all that stuff, right? The values that the cultural piece that you're trying to build as a leader 
you can really transfer that and impart that into the you know the the, the people that are more on the uh, the the bottom rung of the org chart or whatever right so you can have those conversations which are going to really allow that to penetrate throughout the whole organization and i think that is one of the things that i've noticed as you start to build in some of those layers of uh in the hierarchy is just that yeah sometimes i'm not sure if everybody really fully understands the why or the values and so on and so that's that internal communication piece internally marketing i guess all that but uh, one of the best ways to do that would be, yeah, having some lunches. Yeah, that's great. I like it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as startups and, and new entrepreneurs, you likely don't have a formulated vision, mission, values, right? You have your why, yeah. you have what you do. Right. Um, and we didn't create ours other than, you know, coin terms that I would use when talking to clients. We didn't create ours till almost year two and a half. Yeah. And the team got involved and I, I tasked the team with what does involving mean to you and what does working here mean and what do we do? And we had a group brainstorming session and, and, and wonder session about what are our values. And we came to it together, which was a really, really good way of bringing them together and also automatically getting their buy-in because they helped build it. Yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Thanks. So one of the things that uh, we just briefly talked about before we hit the record button was just the uh, structuring a business so that it's not tied, you know, as tightly to your personal brand mm. uh, as the founder as possible so that the, the entity can be separate uh, from you. And uh, it sounded like you were really quite intentional in doing that because there's a lot of founders out there where they are the brand completely. And I, you know, the, the risk that, is apparent there for me anyway, is that if they were to exit the business for whatever reason, you know, or try like try to sell the business, that kind of thing, um, the value then is oftentimes tied to the individual, the yeah. founder, as opposed to the company. And so you're never going to get the, the, the value out of that business. And so, um, that, that would be the biggest reason I can see to, to really try to keep that separate. And that was one of my thoughts when I first started Ample Media. But I want to hear your thoughts about it because we didn't really have a chance to talk too much about that. Yeah, and and you're right. I think it was very intentional. And and I got some feedback, again, probably a year and a half, two years into the business when I was growing and we were recruiting and, and I looked at different ways to grow the business and acquire new clients. And I had brainstormed, oh, well, what if we acted kind of like a legal firm where everybody that comes on is responsible to help fill their own book, right? And yeah. there's lots of reasons why and why not. But at the end of the day, the feedback I got was, Ashley, you are the brand. You are the services and the why. And you know HR and you know the supports you can give. And you know enough about operations that you are that glue to connect the clients to the services. And that was a big wake up call for me. And so it wasn't uh, wake up one morning and it all changes but we worked with our social media team and now, you know, you guys for our website and things and really started to create a personality with it and create a brand with it um, and and detach it a little bit from me and also trained and developed the team to say, I empower you to alter that service or to adapt it if you need to, um, to fit that client. And I think it was a slow evolution that, yes, I'm still tied to the brand. I'm still the face of it and the president. Um, but I truly believe that as my managers take on more and the team takes on more um, and people start recognizing us as an HR and people operations support company, you know, Ashley will be less and less at the forefront and it will be more our brand and, and the services we provide. Um, and, and that's the goal, right? I have no intention of leaving Involvi or, or any of that in the near future. Yeah. But, you know, I think as an entrepreneur, you'd be short sighted not to have that thought process. Um, and consider the options as you grow and as you develop. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really interesting because like uh, 12 years ago when I started Ample Media, I started it kind of on the side of my desk because I had another business at the time uh, that I was running. And so uh, it wasn't meant to necessarily be, it was more like a project more than anything. And then it kind of turned into a business. Yeah. And so uh, I, and I am not the person who's on the tools, so to speak. Um, so I'm not the, uh, at the, those early days, 
um, we were just doing animated video explainers and stuff like that. So very much video focused. And so I didn't know how to do those things. That wasn't me. I could write the scripts and I knew the strategy and I knew how to sell, uh, but I didn't have the skill set. And so I didn't come from it as the, you know, practitioner who becomes then the founder of, of a business. And so um, it was really easy for me to kind of keep myself separated in, yep. in a lot of sense from it. And then I really thought, you know, in terms of like scalability, I wanted to scale beyond just me. I wanted it to be a firm that I could then sell or a spinoff or whatever the case might be at some point in the future. And so I was really quite intentional about the way that I did that. And, um, and so I don't run into too many other entrepreneurs who think that way or, or like when they're starting their businesses anyway. So it's really interesting to find another person. Yeah, it was it was tough because I had a little bit of a different start from you, whereas I was the HR practitioner. I, yeah. I handled the first few clients. I brought on a consultant to kind of take some overflow and and then we really started growing. And, you know, I got to a point where I was managing 10 employees 10 clients myself, plus account managing all of my employees' clients, yeah. as well as running the business, right? And I don't think I slept. I think I got no. a lot of gray hair. I, my husband probably considered, oh, is this for me, right? Like there was a lot yeah. of implications. Yeah. Um, and the biggest, probably first hurdle that I had to go through as the business changed and evolved was getting my clients off of my plate onto yeah. my team and then really starting to elevate myself and develop the team. Yeah. And I've talked to so many entrepreneurs since I've done that, that are embarking on that and have no idea how to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it's a big change, but there are ways to do it and there are ways to, to do it successfully. Yeah. Um, but just, and, yeah. Well, speaking of that though, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that a bit because I know that that was actually a, a difficult time where um, in, in other businesses I've had where w that transition is occurring, where you're stepping back and trying to let a team member now take the, the, you know, the role of servicing that customer and the customer has the relationship with you as the practitioner. <laughs> and, and so it's so difficult to actually do that transition at times because they, they they work around that new person, that new account manager, whoever, uh, whatever the title is, um, oftentimes because they're just so used to calling you up, right? And you yeah. just can't scale that way. So what is the secret there? What are the best practices in your mind in, uh, in doing that transition with your clients? So those who are listening maybe um, can can replicate your success there. Sure. Yeah. I think, you know, first of all, I think you have to expect a productivity dip and, and maybe a few yeah. blips along the way or unhappy clients, or maybe potentially a lost client, um, mm. because you don't know what you don't know. Um, I think number two, go in very transparent. And, and I've said what I just said to you, to all of my clients, you know, and I know you cannot do it all. And my passion is up here and I've got really great people. Um, and I think, you know, you also have to expect a, a little bit of a, a, a higher operational cost while you do that, because there's yep. a lot of shadowing, there's a lot of training, there's a lot yep. of, you know, work in the business that you're going to have to do in duplicate to that person taking over um, to help it transition in a good way. I think you have to look at that. And I think you have to be real with yourself as to how much you can handle and, and how much you can take on um, and make sure that, you know, that you're doing it for good and that, you know, there will be that productivity dip, there will be that transition, yep. um, but trusting them to get it done and encouraging the client if they do happen to just, oh, I called your cell instead of theirs. Say, yeah, no problem. Give them a shout. And and if you still don't get what you need, I'm here for you. Yeah. Um, and I think that really helps that cycle um, transition to the team and empowers them to support. Now you touch a little bit on that that operational dip, which then translates into more you know cost for the business and erosion of of uh, potential returns or or margin at that point while you're doing that transition period. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that you uh, had also shared with me before we hit the record button is that you've built your business um, without going into any type of uh, debt, uh, so it's been self funded. So uh, tell me uh, your, your thoughts around that. Like how, how can others replicate that success? How did you structure things so that 
you could do that because there are so many other entrepreneurs out there who need some sort of infusion of uh, uh, capital, whether that's debt or whether it's equity or financing or whatnot, um, in order for them to get up and rolling and then growing as well. So, so talk to me a little bit about how you found success there. Sure. So I, I also, I want to premise it with my business is very different than a lot. As if you're in a professional services industry and business, I think you have a lot more opportunity to go the route I did without needing a lot of capital, as opposed to an IT business or something else where you need machinery and you need equipment and you need all of this, you yeah. know, capital to at least be viable. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think our industry and what we offer led itself to work really well in that way. Um, but we also started during COVID. Like I went yeah. live with my website February of 2020. And so everything <laughs> yeah. was remote. Um, you know, we did go into the odd client site to help them in emergent situations, but that was mileage, right? I bought a laptop myself at Best Buy at the beginning because it was like, okay, I need a computer. And, and so I spent my money really wisely and made sure that I didn't take on these exorbitant costs if I didn't need them. Yeah. Um, and then as we grew, we just really thought to ourselves, okay, so yes, every proposal, every contract we've got, we're slated to make money, regardless of what the margin was, we are in the black. And once I knew that and didn't focus on how fast can we grow, how many KPIs can we have to show that we are a success, it was more focus on the people and focus on what we do. And so all of our team works from home or from their client sites. Yep. Um, but we do have a shared office that allows us to have meetings, allows us to have a boardroom, allows us to have a quiet space, um, but it's not fancy and it does the job. Uh, and so I would rather put the money that we earn back into our team, back into new services and back into growing the company um, instead of padding our pockets or instead of doing other things. So um, we haven't looked at mergers. We haven't looked at acquisitions. We haven't looked at major new projects or lines of service, which likely will take some capital if we go there. Um, but just growing organically, it's really worked out well for us. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So if you could send a letter back in time to your younger entrepreneurial self, so okay. so Ashley, four years ago, you have that six month old baby in your arm and you're uh, thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. On what a Zoom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give yourself? What would be in that letter? What would you tell yourself? Uh, I'd probably say a few things. Uh, one, um, it's not for the faint of heart being an entrepreneur. I have yeah. never worked harder than I have in the last four and a half years. So if you're yeah, story, getting into right? it because of flexibility and status and being the boss and working remotely, um, very few people are TikTok stars. So I wouldn't, you know, hedge your bets on on doing it easily. Yeah. Um I would also say, don't let yourself stand in your way. Um, oftentimes uh, we are our biggest critic and it's, I can't yeah. do that. I have imposter syndrome. I, nobody's going to want to buy what I sell. Um, and that's not the case because if you believe in yourself, then other people will. And, and that's proven in, in my world. Um, and then I would say, be humble enough to ask for help and yeah. seek help and listen because uh, you don't know what you don't know. And I learn every day. Yep. Um, and the last thing is get used to hearing the word no. In a lot of ways, don't okay. take it personally um, and turn those no's into a yes. And if you have that passion and you have your why, it will propel you forward. Um, yep. So yeah, as as cheesy as some of those are, because it made us at Involvey who we are today, those are probably what I'd say. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, if somebody wanted to connect with you, uh, either to talk about your services or just, uh, you know, have an extension of this conversation. For sure. How, I, like, where do we send them? How do how should they reach you? Great. So we've got a website, although the new one is coming. So involvey.ca. Uh, yeah. You can also reach out to us at my email, ashley at involvey.ca. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. We're on all the social platforms. So uh, there's lots of ways to reach us and contact us, but happy to have conversations with uh, anybody that wants to chat. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Ashley. Really appreciate you taking the time today, sharing your experience, your stories, and some advice for our audience. And for those of you who are listening today and you really like this episode, head over to amplifyyourbusiness.ca. That's where you're going to find our archive of all of our previous interviews, as well as the future ones. And of course, you can listen to us on every major podcasting platform out there. Just search Amplify Your Business in your favorite one, and you'll find us there as well. Until next time, everybody, have a prosperous day.